This is the video on dropped projectiles. So in order to uh, do any problems with uh, projectiles being dropped, we need to look at the kinematic equation. So uh, we've already looked at the kinematic equations before. Um, so let's take a look at the equations we're going to be using for the dropped projectiles. So this, these are the equations we're going to use. Now they should look familiar. They are the kinematic equations. Now the one thing that's different uh, is that when the kinematic equations were introduced, uh, everything was on the x-axis. Uh, now we're looking at the y-axis, but the exact same uh, the, the exact same equations as the kinematic equations, but we're looking at the y dimension. So let's take a look at a drop projectile. Uh, let me just move. All right, there we go. All right. So uh, the origin is going to be at the starting position of the object. Now you'll notice I, I outlined the Cartesian coordinate plane over uh, the object. Now. This is to just get the numbers right, right? So x, we're just used to going horizontally, left to right, the x-axis, and y going up and down, uh, you know, top to bottom. Uh, but you could theoretically rotate the coordinate plane uh, 90 degrees and do the exact same problems. As long as you get the signs correct, uh, the, the math will work out the same. But, and the putting the origin uh, where it, the object originates just makes sense to me, but you could put the origin anywhere you wanted uh, on, on the path and the math would work out the same. It's just easier for me to keep track. Hey, where it originates, I'm going to put the origin. Um, so everything's on the y-axis. Now let's take a look at what that means for the variables. Now v0y in the velo is the velocity the instant his object is dropped. So unless the object is thrown down, that instant velocity at time zero is zero meters per second. It's at rest the instant you let an object go. Now V, the final velocity, or any velocity after that instant in time, uh, that's the velocity at the end of the time interval. Now most of the time when it hits the ground, most of the time is used when it hits the ground. Hey, I drop an object from this height, it hits the ground. How fast is it going? Now the object is moving in the downward direction, in the negative direction, so the final velocity is going to be negative. Uh, in fact, any velocity on, along this path going down, with the exception of the initial velocity, is going to be negative. It's moving downward. Now, the acceleration is, is the object as it's falling. Now, it is, it is speeding up, so the acceleration will be in the same direction as the velocity. So the acceleration is going to be negative. Now, uh, we're going to use negative 10 meters per second squared. Yes, technically it's negative 9.81 meters per second squared, but using negative 10, uh, just makes the math come out a lot easier, and it's a lot easier to conceptualize these problems. Now, delta t is the time interval of the object falling. Notice delta t does not have a direction. It's the one uh, variable in the kinematic equations that does not. Now, delta y is the final position minus the initial position. Uh, it's, it's the displacement, and it will be a negative number. And the reason why it's a negative number is because the final position is below the initial position, right? So that is why, right? And, and you, you have to keep track of all these signs or else uh, the, the math doesn't quite work out. You're going to end up with the wrong sign or end up taking the square root of a negative number or, or end up with, with the wrong sign. So uh, that is why it's important to keep track of these signs. So just a little graphic here. You can see here delta y. Uh, That's the final position, which is at the bottom minus the origin. Uh, it's going to be a negative number. Um, and... My velocity, it's moving in the downward direction. The velocity is going to be negative. The acceleration uh, is caused by net force. It's caused by gravity. And gravity is pulling in the downward direction. It's speeding up because the velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction. And that just makes sense. You drop an object, it's going to get faster and faster. So uh, same problem-solving steps as uh, kinematics. Ask yourself, what variable are you being asked to find? What three variables do you already know? Which equation has those four variables? So let's take a look at a problem we can do. So this is a known height problem. So an object is dropped and uh, falls down for a displacement of negative 20 meters. What is the time interval of this fall? With what velocity does it hit the ground? So let's take it step by step. What is this, what is this problem asking me to find? It's asking me to find that time interval. Now I know three variables. I know the initial velocity for this. You, it's zero meters per second. Now I already put the acceleration there negative 10 meters per second, and I know the displacement. It's going to be negative 20. Now, some problems will give you a height, a height of 20 meters. Well, you have to know that it falls down, right? You have to know that it falls down. Height uh, does not have a direction. It's just height, right? So 
you have to know that the displacement is a negative number. Now I look for the equation that has these four variables. I'm just going to take a shortcut and look for the one that doesn't have final velocity. It's that second one. So I plug everything that I know into the, the equation, uh, use a little bit of algebra, and I can solve for the time interval as two seconds. Now the last thing I can do is solve for the velocity uh, the, as soon as it hits the ground. Uh, so I can use all of these uh, equations. Um, I'm going to use the uh, uh, I'm going to use the top one, right? The top one is just easier. Uh, the bottom one will ensure that if you got uh, the time interval incorrectly, you could still calculate the final velocity correctly. But the top equation is just easier. I just multiply the time by the uh, acceleration, and I get negative 20 meters per second. It's moving downward. So now I can give you a known velocity problem. Now there is a trick to this one. An object lands on the ground with a speed of 50 meters per second. What is the time interval of this fall? What was the displacement of the object? So I already have the acceleration there. We're on Earth, negative 10 meters per second squared. Now, the first thing it's asking me to find is the time interval. How long was this object falling? Now, there is a little trick to, to this question. So you know the initial velocity is zero, right? We're just assuming it's at rest. It's not being thrown down. Now, the final, now it gives you a speed. Speed is a scalar quantity. It only has magnitude. It does not have a direction. So we, you have to know that, great, it's hitting with 50 meters per second, but it's in the downward direction. The velocity is negative 50 meters per second. And uh, I know the initial velocity is zero. So that's a, that's a little trick. Uh, that, that was in this. But you have to keep track of those uh, variables. And now I need to find out what equation has these four variables. It's the top one. I just plug everything in, and I solve for the time interval. It's going to be falling for five seconds. Now, I can use any of these equations to solve for the uh, time. I'm going to use that second one, just because it's, uh, it's a little bit easier. And like I said, you could use that bottom one if you're if you want to double check your work, because you do not need the time interval for that one. Plug everything in, and it's falling down 125 meters, negative 125 meters. The last kind of problem that you can have, uh, an object is in free fall for 10 seconds. What was the displacement of the object? What was the velocity at the end of the time interval? So this one's asking me to find the displacement. I'm given the time interval, and the initial velocity is 0. So now I look for the equation that has all the equations or all the variables except for the final velocity plug everything in that I know, and I get negative 500 meters. Now I uh, can solve for the final velocity. I'm going to use that top one, right? And then I can solve negative 100 meters per second. So these are the uh, three problems that you can have uh, assuming that the initial velocity is zero for drop projectiles. So we asked this question. How can the kinematics equations be used to calculate reaction time? So we did this lab. It was called the ruler drop. So uh, we, first, we looked at a ruler, and you can see what we were doing. Right? So you have a, a person holding a ruler. You're going to try to grab it. Uh, without any warning, uh, that person is going to drop it, and you are going to catch it, uh, getting the, the, that displacement that that ruler fell. So uh, there are two parts to this one, right? One, without warning. Hey, you're just a reaction. You're just reacting to it. And then the second one is with a uh, reaction. Now, uh, if you use a ruler, uh, you want to make sure you're using the centimeter side. And we need that displacement, that, that, that distance that it traveled downward uh, in meters. So you need to convert from centimeters to meters. And you can see on that metric conversion chart, you do that by just moving the decimal to the left uh, two spots. So if you did this experiment, you can see that first one uh, without any warning. It took 25 meters. That ruler fell through the hands 25 meters uh, before they caught it, uh, or 25 centimeters. You convert it, it's 0 0.2500. You need to include the, all the resolution and uncertainty digits for those significant figures. Uh, and that will get you uh, that, those uh, centimeters, or the meters. Now, now we can calculate the reaction time. So let's see how we do that. A ruler is dropped and falls down for a displacement of negative 0 0.2500 meters. What is the time interval of this fall? So this is the displacement. That ruler fell down that amount, uh, and 
I can use, if I know the acceleration, I know the initial velocity was zero, I can solve for the time interval. So I'm looking for that time interval, I know the initial velocity was zero, and that displacement was in meters, how far did that ruler fall down? So I can look for the equation that has these four variables, it's that second equation, I plug everything that I know into there, use a little bit of algebra, and I can solve for that time interval. So 0 0.2236 seconds. So uh, that's, that's just, that keeps track of those significant figures as well. Um, so about a quarter of a second. So the, the last question says, a person walks up to you on the street with a $100 bill and says he will drop the bill through your hands without a warning. And if you catch it, he will give you a $100 bill. But if you miss, you have to give him $5. Do you accept this challenge? Why or why not? And then I give you the length of a $100 bill. So you can see that this sample reaction time, 25 centimeters, right? Uh, probably not. You probably would not be able to do this because the reaction time is not that fast, right? The reaction time takes, it's about a quarter of a second. So uh, if you look at this graph, $100 bill has a length of 15.5 centimeters. Uh, and uh, to catch it falling through your hands, uh, the reaction time would have to be at least 0 0.1750 seconds. So the average human reaction time is about a quarter of a second. So unless that person accidentally closes their hand as the bill is falling, it's not possible to catch that $100 bill. So uh, you can see there's a website to test for your reaction time, uh, and it, it, it does average it out. You can do so many different trials. But here is a uh, graph of the ruler catch. Like Depending on how many centimeters, it can give you the, the reaction time. Uh, so just it, it, it's just a little uh, you know trick that people can uh, play on each other. Hey, catch this dollar bill, I'll, I'll give it to you. Right? You would not be able to do it. But now, how is a drop projectile represented graphically? So we've already looked at this before. When graphing an object's position versus time, the slope of the line is velocity. When graphing an object's velocity versus time, the slope of the line is acceleration. The same thing holds true for dropping projectiles. Uh, and so let's just take a look at position versus time. Well, the object at time zero starts at the origin, and it falls downward. At no point does this projectile goes above the origin, so I know the entire graph is going to be on the negative side. So what does the slope of this line represent? So my slope of a position versus time is going to be the uh, velocity, and I know that it's not a constant velocity. So this is what the slope of a position versus time graph is going to look like for a dropped projectile. Notice that it, it starts at zero and it curves downward. If you look at the slope at every single point, well, it's just becoming more and more negative. It's getting faster and faster because that's what the slope represents, the velocity. So now let's graph the slope at every single point. This, the, and look at the velocity versus time graph. The instant he lets go of the object, the initial velocity is zero. Right, so it's going to start zero. Now, the velocity is going to be negative because it's falling in the downward direction. At no point does this object move in the upward direction. My entire graph is going to be on the negative side. Now, what does the slope of a velocity versus time graph represent? Well, my change in velocity divided by change in time is the acceleration. The slope is going to be a straight line because it's a constant acceleration. This is what my graph is going to look like. Notice it starts at zero, initial velocity, and it goes it's getting faster and faster in the negative direction. And the slope is a constant slope. It is a linear graph. The slope is going to be the acceleration. And if I graph the acceleration versus time, it's not going to change. It's going to be a solid negative number. In fact, I know that number. It's negative 10 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration of all objects on Earth. Now let's answer this question. This one's kind of a fun question. From what height would you have to drop an ant in order to kill it? So in order to answer this, we need to understand terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is when the air frictional forces balance the gravitational forces. Two objects of different mass only fall at the same rate in a vacuum. In the atmosphere, drag forces act on an object as it moves through that, that fluid, or air. So notice the magnitude of the acceleration goes to zero as the drag increases. The velocity goes to a constant velocity. So if, if you look at this, you can see that this dashed line represents hey, we remove the atmosphere. The acceleration should remain the same. This just gives you the magnitude. Um, notice the speed. Uh, it, it, it should continually always get faster and faster. Uh, but you'll notice that once you add it, well, the acceleration, once you start hitting that air, well, it goes down and down and down. Eventually, the acceleration is zero, which means 
well, you're, the, the speed, well, yeah, you're getting faster and faster, but over time, eventually, you're going to get to a terminal velocity where that gravitational force is balanced out by that air friction force. So if we look at terminal velocity, right, uh, the, the, the different objects have different terminal velocities. The terminal velocity of an ant is about 3.9 miles per hour and is not enough to kill an ant. Ants can survive a fall from any height. So just a little interesting thing, like ants, insects do not fear gravity because at no point if they fall off of anything, they're going to reach that terminal velocity pretty quickly and they're going to hit the ground at the same speed. Whether you drop them from a few feet off the ground or from an airplane, they're going to hit the ground at the, the same speed and it's not going to be enough to kill them. Uh, just another, uh, just a fun thing about terminal velocity and uh, gravity. Uh, Verona Rupus is the tallest cliff in our solar system. It's on the Uranus moon of Miranda. It's over six miles high, right? There is no atmosphere on Miranda, so no terminal velocity, but the acceleration is negative 0.0761 meters per second squared. If you were to jump off of Verona Rupus, it would take you about 12 minutes to reach the ground, and you'd be traveling about 125 miles per hour. I always say this would be the fun. Uh, like if, if we could travel uh, around the solar system, this would be a fun uh, like ride. You, you go to the top of this cliff and uh, you, know, you have rockets on and you just jump. It's a 12 minute ride, takes you down to the bottom and you just slowly accelerate. Um, now this was sort of a lab that we did. How did Felix Baumgartner set the world record uh, for the fastest person in free fall if he was limited by terminal velocity? So on October 14th, 2012, Felix Baumgartner set the world record for the highest free fall and highest manned balloon flight. The, the balloon he pil piloted climbed to the stratosphere to a height of 39,045 meters, 24 miles. He pulled his parachute cord 1,500 meters above the ground. Once he pulled his parachute cord, he started traveling at a constant velocity. From the time he jumped to the moment he landed on the ground was 9 minutes and 2 seconds, or 542 seconds answer the following questions based on that information. So the air thins the farther you get above sea level. If you were ever to travel to Denver, you'll find it a little harder to breathe. At the height of 24 miles, which Felix Baumgartner jumped, th there's barely an atmosphere. He just kept accelerating until the atmosphere became thick enough to slow him down. Uh, so during his jump, he reached about 843.6 miles per hour. So the, the speed of sound is in like the, the 700. So he did reach uh, supersonic. And you can see just a little interesting graphic over here. 50% of the air lies below this line, right? And that's Mount Everest. So yeah, once you get past a certain level, the, the, the atmosphere is the, the, the atmosphere is very uh, low, that, that pr atmospheric pressure. Um, so this is just a little information. Uh, terminal velocity, air friction. Okay, we already went over this, right? Uh, the magnitude of the acceleration goes to zero as the drag increases, right? The velocity goes to constant velocity. So this is what happened to Felix Baumgartner. So this was that jump. There's a video that shows that. This was a lab or like a case study that we did. So uh, what we're going to do, like this part is just the part uh, where he uh, jumps, right? So 39,045 meters, he's accelerating his parachute cord above the ground at 1,500 meters. Calculate the time he was in free fall, then calculate his velocity as he pulled that rip cord. Um, so this one, uh, we know the acceleration, right? We're just going to assume the acceleration negative 10 meters per second squared. We're looking for the time that he was in free fall. So I know the initial velocity, the instant he stepped off that, uh, that he, he fell uh, for, uh, uh, you know, he was falling all that. Now notice my displacement. It's not the height. Now displacement is negative, but he did not fall, he was not in free fall for that entire time. He eventually pulled his rip cord. Now this is assuming no air resistance. Um, so I can use that second equation. So all I had to do was take the 39,045, subtract the 1500, make sure it's negative because he's falling below that point. Uh, plug everything in and he was in free fall for 86 seconds, 86.65 uh, seconds, right? Uh, then you can find the velocity as he pulled that rip cord. Um, now, the next part is the constant velocity part. Now that he pulled the ripcord, he's traveling at a constant velocity. The total time Felix was in the air was 9 minutes and 2 seconds, so that's the total time. Felix pulled the ripcord 86.65 seconds later. We got that from the previous problem at 1,500 meters above the ground, which caused him to travel at a constant velocity. 
What was his acceleration as he was traveling at a constant velocity? With what velocity did he land on the ground? So I know the, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the acceleration. I know the uh, time interval and the displacement. The displacement, he pulled the ripcord at 1,500 meters. Um, and uh, time interval, uh, four, uh, 455.35 seconds. All I did was I took the total time, subtracted the time he was in free fall. So my acceleration, it says, what's the acceleration? If he's going at a constant velocity, the acceleration is zero. So now I can solve the velocity. So look what happens when I put zero in for my acceleration. My final velocity is my initial velocity. So he's traveling at a constant velocity. So it doesn't matter which one I find, right? I could, I'm going to solve for the initial velocity. So I plug everything in. I'll use that second equation, negative 3.3 meters per second. That's going to be the same throughout. Now, this was the actual jump. So you can see here. Yes, all the problems that you just saw, those were uh, ignoring air resistance. But when you top in, when you, when you look at air resistance, uh, Felix Baumgartner reached a top speed of 376.39 meters per second. So ours was a lot faster because uh, I had to fudge the numbers to ignore air resistance. But this is the actual graph. So at about 56, or sorry, 50 seconds later, he reached his maximum uh, speed, 376.39 meters per second. Uh, after that, he started to slow down. In your own words, explain what caused this and how it affected his acceleration. Well, at that point, the air got a lot thicker, and it, the air resistance started to slow him down. About 200 seconds into the, the jump, Felix reached terminal velocity. So use the graph to explain what terminal velocity is and how the force of gravity and air resistance relate to each other during terminal velocity. You can see there, uh, about 200 seconds in, his speed remains about the same, about 50 meters per second, or 59. Um, and what happened here was that, well, as, yeah, he's, he's, he's uh, slowing down uh, and until that gravitational force is balanced out by the air resistance. Now, about 250 seconds into the jump, his velocity decreases by a lot, right? So he reaches terminal velocity, he decreases it, explain what caused this and how it affected his velocity and acceleration. At that point, he pulled the parachute. He pulled the parachute. So that, like, increased the air resistance, and then he started traveling at a slower terminal velocity. So now we have much more air resistance, and then the gravity balances him out, and then he can land safely. So these are the another just an example of actual graphs of it. This doesn't show him when he pulled the uh, ripcord, but you can see speed and the altitude as a function of time. So will dropping a penny off the Empire State Building kill someone? This is sort of a uh, you know urban legend. Um, so a penny is dropped from the observation deck of the Empire State Building and falls for a displacement of negative 380 meters. What is the time interval of this fall? With what velocity does it hit the ground? So we're looking for the time that it's going to be in the air. Uh, I, same, same, same thing. This is just a known uh, displacement, known height problem. So I know the initial velocity is zero. Plug everything into the equation that has those four variables and I can solve for that time, 8.7 seconds. Then I can solve for the final velocity. So negative 87 meters per second, that's pretty fast. Now, this is just a, a problem that you calculate. This does not represent what a penny would actually do. There's air resistance, right? So it is a much smaller object. Penny is not gonna kill somebody dropped off the Empire State Building. It's gonna sting. Right, I mean, you it, it definitely don't do it, uh, but it, it's not going to, right? It's it's going to reach terminal velocity pretty quickly, and it will uh, it, it it it'll, it'll sting, but uh, it's not going to. And there are videos out there of people that show how this is done. I know MythBusters did it, and there's a, there's a lot of videos out there that show that. So I recommend going looking at those. All right. So once again, there is just too much unknown in the universe to take a break from learning. Get out there and question everything.